All right, thank you, Brad. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. It's an honor to be here today. And um, I'm gonna talk to you about my research and about my vision for the Wasteman Center. Um, but I'll start with some background um, so that you kind of get a sense for who I am beyond my academic credentials. So um, I'll tell you about personal and professional background, about my laboratory here at the center, and then, then about my vision for the future. Um, so I developed an interest in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, when I was in high school through volunteer work. And I spent my summers when I was in college um, working at a camp, Wisconsin Badger Camp down in Prairie du Chien, which was a camp that served adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so this is the mid 80s, it's kind of an exciting time. There was a lot of legislation at that time um, that was just uh, coming through, education for all handicapped children, deinstitutionalization. It was a big time in the IDD world. And um, so my summers at camp as a counselor um, were very moving to me and actually had a really big impact on my, uh, on my life and on my career. So it was at Wisconsin Badger Camp that I had my first experience with someone who used augmentative and alternative communication. So this picture um, is of a woman named Bev. And Bev came, came to camp. She lived in an institution in southern Wisconsin. And she had this communication board on her wheelchair, which is called an e-tran board. And what she would do is she would look at the numbers on this board and you as a communication partner would stand on the other side and look where her eyes were gazing. And you would identify the number that she was pointing to. So on her tray, she had a couple hundred different words and phrases. You would look and you might see she pointed to one, to three, and to eight. And you walk around to the other side, you look at that board and you see one, three, eight. Handsome, okay? So she's very limited in what she could say. Um, only limited to what those words and phrases were on her board. And um, she frequently would, would reference, she, she didn't have a word or names for people at this camp because you know, that couldn't be planned in advance. And she would frequently um, comment about handsome pool. Okay? Um, and so what she wanted was to go and see the lifeguard at the pool. <laughs> and in fact, um, he was handsome. There she is, <laughs> with handsome pool, and you can see the light in her eyes, the, the spark on her face, and I was uh, hooked. That was a, a life-changing experience for me to know her and to spend some time with her in the summer, and I went on to become a speech-language pathologist after that. And yes, in case you were wondering, that last slide was me in 1988 at the age of 19. I spared you the permed hair. Um, so I worked as a clinical speech language pathologist for about seven years before I finished my PhD. And one of the things, you know, I really enjoyed clinical work, but one of the challenges to me was um, the lack of, of research to support our clinical interventions. We didn't call it evidence-based back then in the 90s, um, but it's what we think of right now as evidence-based practice. What do we use to guide what we do? And there was so much less of it then. Um, I found it frustrating and difficult to be a practitioner just sort of guessing. And so um, I wanted to go back to school to learn how to do research and to do something that would contribute to clinical practice and improve the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, particularly people with cerebral palsy. So I came to UW, uh, back to UW in 2003 after completing my uh, doctoral work. And part of why I came back to UW was an amazing department, Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders, and also the Wasteman Center. And the opportunities that the Wasteman Center offered me um, in terms of building a research career here that focused on people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so, um, so that is why I'm here today. And, um, I want to say that it's really amazing as I stand here and reflect on just being here today, it was one person who lit a spark. And I think it's an interesting and powerful testament to the power that we all have to ignite other people's passion, um, to do things that, that may have an impact um, in some way on the world. And so um, I'm now a professor in communication sciences and disorders. I've been the chair of that department for almost two years. I've been working in the Clinical Translational Corps for six or seven years um, here at the Waisman Center, and of course, uh, doing research, studying speech, language, and communication development in children with cerebral palsy. 
So, my lab here at the Weisman Center is the Wisconsin Intelligibility, Speech, and Communication Lab, which I will hereafter refer to as the WISC Lab. Um, and these are some pictures of all of the things that we do in my lab and the people in my lab. Um, and really our, our guiding principle or motto is that communication is the essence of human life, right? It's our ability to communicate that makes us uniquely human. Um, and so our focus is to improve communication outcomes for people with cerebral palsy. So let's talk about cerebral palsy. Um, as I segue into talking about what my research has been, um, let's get on the same page. Cerebral palsy uh, can be def defined by four basic features. It's problems with development of movement and posture. So motor control problems are a standard problem in everyone that has cerebral palsy. It can vary greatly in severity, but everyone has motor problems. Um, it's caused by a disturbance or anomaly in early brain development. So either prenatal um, or uh, it, uh, postnatal, shortly after birth or even during the birth process, these, these problems can um, come on. It's not progressive in nature, so not getting worse over time, not getting better over time. And it involves problems with sensation, cognition, communication, perception, behavior, and or seizure disorder. So there are lots of potential comorbidities or co-occurring problems that an individual's CP may experience. The prevalence of CP is very stable. It's about 3.5 per 1,000 in the United States. Um, and this has been pretty steady for 20 some, maybe closer to 30 some years now. <laughs> People with CP often have communication problems. And in the literature, the general medical estimate, based on physician impressions of communication abilities of their patients with CP, is that about 60% um, of people with CP have communication problems. But that is based on sort of a gross measure. And, and previously, the particular nature of those communication problems had not been well studied. So. We know communications are, communication problems are very common in CP. Um, one big issue is that often people don't think about communication problems until it's late. We don't really expect children to start talking until they're about 12 months of age. Kids with CP are at risk for communication problems from birth. And, um, and we don't really start paying attention until they miss these key milestones at 12 months, 18 months, two years of age. So we really don't start worrying clinically until we're starting to see very pronounced problems. Um, that's a problem for intervention, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. We know that people with CP are very heterogeneous. The presentation of communication problems can vary greatly, um, and I'll elaborate more on that in just a moment. But one of the key um, principles of the work that we're doing is the idea of reducing heterogeneity by identifying subgroups within the larger whole. So everyone with CP does not look the same. It really depends on, on um, profiles of deficits and underlying challenges and strengths. And so what we're trying to do, largely in my lab, is to identify profiles so that we can predict outcomes so that we can then change outcomes if we can predict what outcomes are gonna be, and that we can develop interventions that are tailored to specific profile groups with the ultimate goal of um, improving quality of life for individuals with CP. So the long-term goal of my work, first and foremost, is to generate database longitudinal models of speech and language development, which means we're following the same kids for long periods of time. And with this information, what we intend to do is to develop models to predict outcomes, to develop and test interventions for particular subgroups or profiles of, of children with CP, and use this information to guide treatment decision making so that we can do better treatment decision making earlier based on what we know will be the outcome for our children with CP. So our current studies in my lab, we have two R01s that are seeking to identify profile groups of children with CP based on their communication abilities, examine how those groups change over time, to quantify specifically changes in speech, language, and communication, develop growth curves that, that do that quantification, and identify early predictors of later outcomes. We're also starting to do work that's testing the effects of be behavioral intervention on functional speech ability for different profile groups. Um, so these are intervention efficacy studies that were, uh, are currently underway. So 
I'm going to give you the 30,000 foot view of what goes on in my lab, which is going to be really hard. So bear with me. I'm going to try not to go into too many details, but more give you the big picture of what we're finding and what we're doing. Um, and I am a speech pathologist, so I can talk really, really fast. So I'll try not to do that. Um, so since 2005, we have been following a cohort of children with cerebral palsy longitudinally. Um, the kids were quite young when they were enrolled initially in the study, um, between two and four years old on initial enrollment. And we've been seeing kids twice a year until they're eight years old and then once a year after the age of eight. Um, we bring the kids in to the Wasteman Center um, and we work with them for up to three hours collecting measures of speech production, language, uh, multimodal communication, parent-child interaction. We have parents complete a bunch of questionnaires. It's a pretty comprehensive battery of tests and it's pretty much the same thing every time. So we can look at how kids change over time on the same measures. We've seen about 120 different children with cerebral palsy to date. Um, right now, 10 years in, um, we're still following 80 of those kids. And um, some of those kids have come 19 times to the Wasteman Center to participate in our research. Um, we have about 1,500 data collection sessions on kids with CP. So this is an enormous amount of data. And if you're wondering what um, 4,500 hours of data collection looks like, it's a lot of videos. These are DVDs of all the sessions. Um, and these are the paper files of all the sessions, of the test scores, the parent questionnaires, and all of these things. This is old school. We have uh, transitioned to an electronic database where we're streaming our video onto the network now. We've been making great use of the Wasteman Center's core services. But um, let me tell you, for the young people out there, start now with building databases, because this was an onerous task that we started about five years ago to get all these files entered into a database so we could develop queries where we could very quickly and easily address you know, pretty interesting research questions without a lot of work. So, um, so this was a really important advancement um, to help us answer more questions more quickly about our children. Okay, so I'm gonna give you some highlights of our research findings. Again, focusing on the 30,000 foot perspective um, rather than on the specifics of the methods, but I'm very happy to take questions about specifics um, as we uh, move through the talk here. So, the key variables that I'm gonna talk about today um, were measures of speech motor impairment. So does a child have dysarthria? Dysarthria refers to the physical involvement of the speech musculature that you see in people who have cerebral palsy. So if you've seen someone with CP, you know that there are motor involvement or obvious motor signs for most people in the body. The same thing happens in the orofacial musculature for some people. And so dysarthria is what that sounds like when the muscles of the head and neck and respiratory system are involved. So we're interested in how many kids have dysarthria um, who, who also have CP and what the co-occurring kinds of language problems, communication problems might be with that. We're also interested in speech intelligibility. So how understandable um, is the child? How many words are listeners actually able to make sense of when they're talking and how does that change over time? What are the language abilities of a child? The data I'm gonna show you today are mostly receptive language and that is what people understand from what a, ch uh, what a child understands from what is being said to him or her, okay? So how, how well does a child comprehend relative to his or her age expectations? And then we're also looking at profile group membership. So I told you one of the main goals of this work was to identify subgroups who have common features so that we can think more efficiently about outcomes and intervention. And so um, I'll show you some data on profile groups as well. So to start with, I'm not gonna go through all the details of this model, but this is basically our a priori model or the, where we started with thinking about how might we subdivide kids into groups. So you can go at a, a, a categorization task with an idea of how they might fall out up front based on sort of theoretical um, underpinnings, or you can go after it with no idea at all and do statistical modeling and see what falls out from a statistical model. And we've done both of those approaches. Um, and as a spoiler alert, they actually map pretty well onto each other, so that made us pretty happy. Our clinical profile groups 
that I'm showing you here are really just based on whether or not a child has speech motor involvement, so are the muscles of the face that are used in speech production also affected um, by the person's motor disability of cerebral palsy. Some kids don't have any involvement, so that's great. They're their own group. Um, for the children that do have speech motor invo involvement, are they able to talk or not? Some kids are so involved that they can't produce any speech, and those kids are their own group. They're unable to speak, or we call them anarthric. And then we have kids who have speech motor involvement. Their speech sounds slurred. They sound like they have a speech impairment. They may be hard to understand. Some of those kids have language impairment too, so they have a hard time understanding um, things that are said to them. They may have intellectual disability on top of that. Um, they have more complex communication challenges. And some kids have really great intellectual abilities and great language comprehension abilities. They just have a speech impairment where it's very difficult for them to produce speech. It's difficult for listeners to understand them. So they're their own group, and they all have very different intervention needs. So this is our, our sort of theoretically driven model based on what we know about kids with CP and what we know about speech and language development. So we set out to test that model to say, well, all right, if we categorize kids into these, into these groups, um, how many of them fall into each group, and is it actually valid? Um, and what we found in four-year-olds, four-year-olds were kind of easy. Four-year-olds are, are, are sort of compliant to work with. They were easy to get our measures on. The younger you get, the more you have issues with getting kids to do what you want them to do. So there's lots of magic involved in that. Um, and so what we found in four-year-olds, and also four-year-olds should be talking. They should be doing a lot of things, okay? Um, so about 32% of our four-year-olds were unable to speak. No, fewer than five words um, in their productive repertoire, okay? Um, we found that 24% of our kids had typical speech and typical language. They really had no motor involvement, no language involvement. These are the kids we're not too worried about. They don't, they don't have the challenges that the other kids have. We found that 18% of our kids had speech motor impairment um, or dysarthria, so their speech was involved, and they had language impairment. And, and usually for those kids, there's a co-occurring intellectual disability as well. And then about 26% had um, speech motor involvement and normal language skills, so they could understand what was going on. They just had trouble producing speech from a motor perspective. Okay, great. So if you, if you do the math on this, what you can see is that that estimate that the physicians came up with of 60% of kids with CP having some kind of communication problem is actually an underestimate. We get about 75% of kids at four having some kind of communication problem. So if we look more closely, we find some different um, results. We then ask the question about two-year-olds. Okay, so two-year-olds are a whole different beast um, to study. and. As it turned out, we tried to apply that initial model to two-year-olds, but we really couldn't. We had to come up with a different model, and this is where we used um, statistics to identify what the profile groups of two-year-olds were, because they didn't fit into the other model, because most of them weren't talking. So, but we did know, or we suspected, that those kids would actually go on to talk later on. So what we found here when we looked at um, primarily language data from these kids and some spontaneous interactions, um, is that only 15% of the two-year-olds were what we would call good talkers or established talkers. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing developmentally. 41% um, of those kids were not talking at all at two, and 44% were what we called emerging talkers. So they were starting to put words together, um, starting to produce more speech, but it was delayed relative to what we would expect for their age. Okay, so two-year-olds fall into different groups than four-year-olds, great. How do these groups map onto each other? Well, we took our 24-month-olds, same kids, um, and we looked at them when they were 54 months, and what we found was of these kids who were established talkers, they had great outcomes when they were 54 months old, mostly. About a quarter of them went on to have no speech motor impairment, um, good communication functioning, 75% of them though, um, did have dysarthria or slurred speech, speech motor impairment, but they had good language skills. So talking early is a good sign for what you're gonna end up being able to do by time you're four and a half. When we took our emerging talkers, they were a little bit more divided between those three groups. A few of them went on to have no impairment. Um, some of them had language problems um, and speech problems, and some, some of them just had speech problems. 
But these kids who are not yet talking did not have great outcomes. So if they weren't talking by two, um, they really wound up very likely to be anarthric later on when they were four. Um, and so what we see here is that these early profiles are actually highly predictive of later outcomes and later talking status. That has huge intervention implications. That means when you see a kid at two and you see he's not talking yet, the odds of that kid going on to not be able to talk when they're four are really high. And you need to think about intervention differently for those kids. Um, we've also been looking at how intelligibility develops from 24 to 54 months, so longitudinally. This is how understandable a child's words are. So on the um, y-axis, we have percent of words that are intelligible produced by a particular child. On the x-axis, we have the age of the children. And the individual lines in here are actually individual children. The solid lines are means, okay? Now what we have here for the different colors are the age that the child started talking by group. So what we can see is that kids who started talking sooner, when they, they were talking at 24 months of age, had the best outcomes when they were um, 54 months of age. So they had the highest intelligibility. Um, kids who started talking later didn't get as high by the time they were 54 months of age. So the age that you start talking matters for where you end up when you're uh, four and a half years old. The other interesting point here was that when they start talking, most of all the kids were right around 20% intelligible, regardless of what age it was that they started talking. Um, and so we thought that was pretty interesting too. But also noteworthy is that the highest any kid got up to, um, or actually on average, was about 65% intelligible by four and a half years old. That's, that's not good. So these kids are delayed in their intelligibility development with CP, even kids um, who didn't have speech motor impairment, delayed in intelligibility development. Okay, this is a busy slide, and I have to tell you, this, this is nine years worth of data collection. This is like being pregnant for nine years and giving birth right here. <laughs> this is like my favorite picture ever. Um, and we're just in the process of analyzing uh, these data. But what I can tell you, again, we have intelligibility on the y-axis and age on the x-axis up to 96 months of age. This is all of our kids with CP, and these are longitudinal trajectories of the change in their intelligibility development. So a couple noteworthy things here. One is that most of the kids haven't plateaued yet at 96 months of age. Some of them are doing pretty well, close to 100%, but most of them are not, okay? So they're still changing, even when they're 96 months of age. What we have here, this line in the middle, is 50% intelligibility. And we did some statistical analyses and some statistical modeling to look at what is the age at which children reach 50% intelligibility and how does that relate to the age that they plateau or actually the highest point that they reach in terms of the asymptote for intelligibility in this data set. So on the, on the uh, bottom dot plots here and on the side, this is the statistical model. And I want to draw your attention to this figure right here, which is showing us that children who, a negative correlation, highly significant relationship, that children who reach their 50% intelligibility at earlier ages get to higher intelligibility later on. So the sooner you get there to 50%, Younger, right? The younger you are when you get to 50%, the better your outcome is later on, okay? Um, and so that's a pretty interesting finding. And we're working on looking at um, uh, identifying profile groups or subgroups within this mass of data and trying to figure out some other predictors that might help us uh, unwrap this, uh, this question of how early speech ability predicts later speech ability that will again lead to intervention implications that point us toward augmentative and alternative interventions for many of these kids that don't make a lot of progress at all and never get to 50% intelligibility. Um, so, We also looked at receptive language development um, from 18 to 54 months in these kids. This is how well they understood. And what we found was that our children who didn't have speech motor impairment, this, this gray line here is what a typical child should look like. This is um, their language comprehension age equivalent and their age in months. So kids should be progressing along that gray line if they're progressing like typically developing children. And what we found is that um, our children without speech motor impairment look great and are maybe a little bit accelerated in the blue. 
Our children with um, dysarthria or speech motor impairment have a constant six month delay in their language comprehension development and that our anarthric children have a very significant delay and aren't making a lot of progress. Um, and so this is an important group for us to think about from an intervention perspective. Okay, so what we have found here is that most children with CP appear to have significant speech and language problems relative to age expectations. Um, there are patterns or profile groups of children that differ from one another. Early profiles are highly predictive of and linked to um, later profiles and abilities. Kids who start talking earlier do better, and kids who make faster progress earlier do better later on. Um, and whether or not a child can speak and how well a child is able to speak seems to be related to their receptive language skills. So there probably are a lot more questions in these, um, in these conclusions than there are answers, but we certainly have um, a long way to go to start to unwrap the mystery further of, of what's going on with these children and how we can advance um, interventions for them, identification of them, and improve quality of life for them. All right, so we're currently, um, I have an R01 that's being reviewed tomorrow. Um, so send good vibes. It's the, it'll be 15 years of this work, so it's to fund the next five years where we're going to um, follow the children up into the high school years, um, continue with the same cohort. We're gonna add a younger cohort of kids to start tracking them when they're 12 months of age to look more carefully at early predictors of speech development. And currently, um, ongoing in the lab, we have another R01 where we're working on developing benchmarks for separating typically developing intelligibility development from atypical development in children with CP to create clinical cut points um, for when a kid is atypical so we can think about intervention from a functional perspective there as well. So of course, acknowledgments. I have um, lots of lab members who've contributed, colleagues, um, and collaborators, and of course funding sources, but most importantly are the children and their families who have kept coming back year after year. Families have so generously allowed us to watch their children and to learn from their children, and these are just a few of the kids that have been participating, with permission, of course, um, over many years. So on that note, I shall transition into the vision for the Wasteman Center. So, this is a little daunting to think about. Um, and one reason it's daunting is because the Wasteman Center is in good shape. Um, you know, from my own perspective and the perspective of many people that I've talked to, this is a great place. We have lots of resources here. Um, people are doing well, we're doing good work, we're doing important work. Um, but, you know, time marches forward, things change, and every new director of the Wasteman Center has the opportunity to create a legacy. Um, and move forward, create changes. So what else do we want to add to this already exciting place? So that's what I'll um, talk to you a little, about, a little bit about right now. We always look at the, um, I always look at our little logo and sort of wonder what does it mean? Um, and so I'm gonna kinda unpack that a little bit. Um, we are a research powerhouse at the Wasteman Center. Um, we are an intellectual and developmental disability research center. There are 45 laboratories here. There are 95 NIH grants here. There are 20 departments represented. And there is a lot of amazing science from basic bench science to applied clinical intervention work and everything in between. So um, it's an exciting place for research for sure. We are also a huge clinical service provider for people um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There are 11 different clinics that provide services directly to families and to children, um, and those include the Autism and DD Clinic, the Cerebral Palsy Clinic, the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic. We do amazing work in our clinics to serve our community. We do student training. So the, the clinical service and the student training and the outreach, of course, which I'll talk, talk about next, come through the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, um, of which we are one. So the student training um, is critical to our mission, training the service providers and the research, researchers of tomorrow so that they can carry forward um, all of the work that we're doing today. Um, there's also the LEND program, the Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities, which is a really important piece, putting students out there who can be leaders in service provision and training other leaders of the future. 
And finally, uh, and certainly not least, the community outreach arm of the Wasteman Center does really critical work with serving our local community, um, particularly um, the, the preschool right here in the building, the Family Action Network, the Communication Development Program, the Wasteman Resource Center, and all of the services that are offered over at Olin Avenue. Um, really important work touching our community. What I think is most important, however, about the Wasteman Center is that fifth circle right in the middle. That is the sweet spot. That's where we come together with all of these things. Interacting between the research domain and the student training and the clinical service and the community outreach to really create what's special about the Wasteman Center. And you know, when you think about us being special, we actually really are legitimately special. It's not just an opinion. So um, there are 14 use, uh, uh, IDDRC sites um, that are funded by the National Institutes of Health. We are one of them. Um, there are USEDs all over the country, at least one in every state, and there are MCH LEND programs also um, throughout the country. We are one of only seven centers that have both a USED and a LEND and an IDDRC. That is truly the sweet spot. We have it all right here. Um, and so not only is it here, we're all in the same building by and large, quite unique. Um, that is not the case for the other IDDRCs. They don't live in the same physical space. So um, we really are special. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about investing in the present and investing in the future. And so I'm gonna try to work with a timeline here. Um, our clinics are about serving patients and community today. Patient needs are on fire. They can't wait for answers from the research domain. They can't wait for new students to be trained. Patients come to the clinic because they need answers today. Um, we have a waiting list in our clinic and you know, it would be great if we didn't. And so thinking about how we can serve more people um, with the knowledge that we have right now, we don't get to wait for the answers with research. Um, we're also training students. And these are the future clinicians and researchers. And so they're a little bit more distal in terms of time. It takes a couple years to train students and researchers and put them out to populate the field. They're a bit of a longer term investment. And we're also doing groundbreaking world-class research here. But this is truly a long-term endeavor. We're doing it now, but the answers do not come now. The answers maybe come in a year. Uh, or more, I mean, I'm looking at my own work, it's been 10 years and we're finding some answers, but we don't have solutions for things. And so um, it's a long-term investment, the research enterprise. And so as I think about our resources and our future, I think about how we have to invest in what's going on right now, getting the services to the patients. Uh, we have to invest in making sure that the research and the service enterprises continue by putting out the best and the brightest students who will carry it forward. And we have to invest in the science that's gonna change what we do in the clinic and change how we train our um, future researchers and clinicians. So we gotta be uh, really attentive to all of those areas and thinking really specifically about the timeframes of each of those enterprises. So we can think about the research pipeline in lots of different ways. There are many paradigms for thinking about types of research and how they interact um, and, and how they stream together or not. This is just one um, way of thinking about it where we have basic science, you can't really see that, but it says translational research, efficacy studies and outcomes and effectiveness research that actually reaches out into the community and all of these stream together to lead to improved outcomes for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That's the ultimate goal of all of this. We have a lot of amazing work going on in this building. But as I read the core grant, and I read the 95 abstracts of the projects that are on the core grant, um, what I came to was that we have a lot of basic science work, groundbreaking, amazing basic science work that's focused on animal models or on translation from animal to human models. Um, we have a lot of translational research as well in the building that's looking at understanding different IDD conditions in clinical populations or in typically developing populations, but we have very little in the way of efficacy studies and outcomes research. In fact, only two of the projects on the core grant are outcomes and efficacy studies that focus on interventions. So for me and my uh, vision for the Wasteman Center in the long term, what I would like to see is growth in this area where we're focusing some resources and some efforts on research that deals with patient-oriented um, 
clinical trials and outcomes and efficacy work so that we can fill out this pipeline and be uh, absolutely excellent and outstanding in all areas of research for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so here is my long-term vision for tomorrow that will take time to grow, um, is to grow our efficacy and outcomes effectiveness research portfolio. Um, we need more investigators in these areas. We need some seed monies. Um, to support this work, we need to build our connections with the Institute for Clinical um, Translational Research, or ICTER, um, the School of Medicine and Public Health, the hospital. We have to foster these connections. ICTER has a new director that will be starting in July. It's a perfect opportunity for a new director from the Wasteman Center to connect and really start to build out our capacity for clinical trials and translational, clinical translational research. Um, and so that's a, a major goal and probably my primary focus um, as director of the Wasteman Center to grow what we do in those areas. I think we have to build bridges between clinical and research enterprises. We have world-class clinics in the Wasteman Center and we're not collecting any data in those clinics. There's a reason for that. Patients come here not to be research participants but because they have a medical need. Um, and so we need to be mindful and respectful of that but we also need to understand that through the electronic medical record, data can be gathered um, that's readily available and requires nothing from patients, and we don't have that capacity right now. Um, we need to move toward um, building that capacity. And we have to create pathways to clinical research. We won't be able to grow an efficacy and outcomes effectiveness research portfolio without clinical pathways that leverage the resources we already have in the building and on campus. We have to capitalize on our basic and translational research strengths. We need to maintain our stronghold in these areas and continue to expand. We just found out that the cluster hire was awarded to the genetics um, and genomics uh, application. So there'll be three new investigators coming through the Wasteman Center focused on genetics. And so that's great. We need to maintain what we already do so well and we already have a big um, effort focused toward um, as well as grow in these new areas. I would also like to see us build infrastructure for bioinformatics and high throughput computing. I think that um, we're behind relative to what's available on campus in terms of our computing infrastructure, particularly for these very, very um, big data and, and large things like the imaging facility. Some of my own work with streaming video has been challenging with the infrastructure that we have in the building. So we need to connect on campus with other resources, for example, in computer science. Um, and we need to really invest and expand in our computing core resources, as well as bioinformatics. So connections with um, statistics, biostatistics, methodological expertise that will let us take our questions to the next level. Um, it's multidisciplinary and collaborative. I think we could think about developing greater capacity and in technological innovations for people with disabilities through research, development, and implementation. We used to have um, the Trace Center here in the Wasteman Center. And the Trace Center focused on assistive technologies for people with disabilities. Um, the Trace Center um, has left our campus and, and really left a big void. Um, there is room for this and we're a place that could really implement it. Connecting with um, engineering, with com computer science, to do things like um, app development and testing, to take off on things like brain computer interface and human computer interaction. Um, these are big, hot areas. Uh, in the world right now, and we could get on board with that um, as, as a future direction. We need to examine our campus reach and build strength and ties with other units on campus. There's a lot of stuff going on on this campus, and sometimes we live in silos because we're busy and we all have a mission, but if we build bridges and do more connecting, um, I think we can all benefit from that. So um, the McBurney Center supports students with disabilities on campus. To my knowledge, we don't connect at all with the McBurney Center at the Wasteman Center, and we should. Um, the Mortgage Center for Service Learning with our USAID. Um, the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, again, the Institute for Clinical Translational Research. The Engineering Department, Computer Science, Nursing, Physical Therapy, there are lots of connections we don't have. We have a lot of connections. There are 20 different departments represented at the Wasteman Center, but what else is right here that we're missing? Um, I think we need to investigate that and consider the possibilities as we move toward the future. 
I think we need to expand our capacity for serving people with IDDs, right? Um, and so whether that means making the clinics bigger, um, I don't know. I don't know what's, what's possible with space and with personnel and all of these things, but I think it's worth investigating. Um, things like medical services for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities who age out of the pediatric services. Um, training professionals and researchers, as I said, students are the future. We have to invest in students. So thinking about how can we reach people through off-campus distance education? Um, how can we expand or highlight existing opportunities for students within the center so that we can really um, integrate those people in learning and doing the things that we're already doing? Um, I think thinking about extending the reach of the USED. So the, the clinics and the outreach activities Maybe we need more intervention programs. I mean, it's really easy for me to stand up here and say, we need more of this, we need more of that. And obviously, these are big directions that need investigation and careful study, but these are just some ideas of things that I think are worthy of a, a more detailed look. Um, and what about support for outreach activities? You know, our outreach um, groups are getting big funding cuts, and that's wrong. We need to figure out how to fix that problem for the outreach that's going on right here in Dane County um, and through the Wasteman Center uh, that's, that's actually gonna go away if they don't get more money. So, so that's the future. Today, what we need to do, and what we can do right away, I think, is start to uh, really work to ensure that Wasteman's, the Wasteman Center is an inclusive environment where all people are welcome. People from all backgrounds, disabilities, um, as well as minority groups and everyone who wants to be here has an interest in this place is welcome here. I think we need to maintain our stronghold as an IDDRC, um, continuing to build relationships with local partners, including the Marshfield Clinic up in Marshfield, which is a relatively new partnership for the Wasteman Center, but a potentially very, very powerful set of connections. Um, continue to integrate the USED, the LEND, and the IDDRC activities so that we're doing more with training students and reaching the community and letting students participate in or be exposed to whoops, research activities that are going on in the building. We have to invest in the leaders of the future. Um, and these are the students and trainees and the junior faculty members, the people who are just getting started because they're gonna carry it forward. Um, and of course, support the leaders of the present so that the mid-career and senior level people um, feel valued and have the resources they need to continue to do their groundbreaking work as well. We need to continue to offer world-class clinical services to people with IDD conditions, support our local IDD community, and again, make sure that these outreach activities are maintained. Um, and build community inside the center. It was really interesting, one of the themes through the conversations I had this morning was that what people want in the, in the Wasteman Center is more connection and more opportunities to interact and understand what's going on in different um, units within the center, different laboratories within the center, and, and find ways to, um, to work together. And so I think that's an exciting opportunity that's actually pretty easy to implement um, to create, to create uh, spaces for people to interact. So the money is always an issue, right? Um, you know, grants, of course, obviously. Are there other core grants um, that we could get, other program project grants that we could get um, for categories of things that are going on in the center? Everyone always says philanthropy. Yep, philanthropy is definitely the answer, but easier said than done, right? So I think what we need to do with philanthropy is, is build initiatives. I think we have to have specific priorities that are well-defined, and then you can go after um, you know, targeted people who have interests in giving to those areas. I think it's a lot easier to get giving for something specific than it is to get giving for something generic, where people don't know where their money is going. We could think about larger fundraising events. I think about the things that the Carbone Cancer Center does. They're visible all over the community for fundraising. Wasteman Center could do that stuff too. Um, and they make a lot of money on activities like the, you know, there's a big bike ride in some prairie in the fall or those kinds of, I mean, we live in a really athletic community. People will come to do things, especially for charity. So, um, so we could fundraise that way. Um, we could target our alumni base. Many people come through the Wasteman Center for training in one way, shape, or form. Um, what if we reach out to them more and we, um, and we get their feedback and support and um, try to leverage that resource? We could think about new revenue generating programs, including 
Um, maybe it's service lines for intervention that generate revenue. Maybe it's certificate programs, online learning programs, telehealth activities. We do things uh, that people will pay really good money for, and I think we could do more with leveraging that potentially, but obviously this requires detailed study and investigation to, um, to figure this out. So, what do I want for the Wasteman Center overall? I think I want the Wasteman Center to be the leader in what the future looks like for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I think we need to pave the way along the entire research continuum, from basic science to intervention and outcomes work. Um, I think we need to continue populating the field with the best and the brightest clinical practitioners and researchers. I think we need to continue to serve our local community so that the people right here in Madison and Dane County in the state of Wisconsin are the first ones to benefit from the work that we do here. Um, and ultimately, to improve the health, well-being, and quality of life for people with IDD conditions, both at home and throughout the world. That's what I have. So we were just talking about this morning, uh, about that very thing, um, this morning in some of our earlier conversations, and I think um, the, the Wasteman Center Early Childhood um, Preschool Program is really an exemplary program. Um, it serves many, many children. Many of those children participate in our research, and I know um, it's something that we should leverage more and integrate more into the whole of the Wasteman Center, I think. Um, highlighting that more uh, would be really useful to the public um, as well as to the Wasteman Center. And I know that the, the program is interested in being more integrated in the center as well. So, important. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm curious as to how you would propose to better blend what you said blend and IDDRC so blending the USED LEND and IDDRC programs is, yeah, I mean, my, my first response to that is I think students are the pathway from between programs, right? It's our students who, they work in the laboratory, they do clinical experiences through the USED, maybe they're LEND trainees. So I think leveraging our students and starting to build connections with our students where we tie things together um, is a really good first place to start. They're already doing it, but we need to participate as faculty and as researchers in these activities. So I think creating simple opportunities um, where we can come together and understand um, what happens in each of these arms of the Wasteman Center could be really powerful. Um, and in particular, you know, one of the things that we talked about earlier this morning was the idea that hearing from the clinicians in the, in the clinics, the physicians and the therapists, um, the service providers about what the real problems are that they experience to help us, you know, populate our, our research questions to think about things that are real um, issues that need to be addressed um, would be one way. And hearing that from students too to build these bridges. Um, but I do think students are key to the integration. So a questions? So, 
19, your academic career has been nurtured and developed here at the Wiseman Center. When you think back to when you came here, um, what really worked and was helpful? What do you wish would have been more helpful? And, and what could we do now to help uh, to develop uh, professional careers in this field? That's a good question. So for my personal career, um, I needed clinical, I needed children with cerebral palsy. And we have a cerebral palsy clinic here, but I couldn't really go through the clinic to get the kids. Um, and so I worked kind of around the clinics to get the kids. And I found the kids, they came um, readily, but I didn't use Wasteman Center resources to get them. I think we need to make pathways to make that happen. It took a lot of person power. I was beating the bushes on the phone to everyone in this town and Milwaukee um, who serves people with CP. And uh, I think we can pave those paths for people to get better access. And we've made tremendous progress in the clinical translational core since then, um, as well with the DD registries. Um, but that's certainly one thing. I think, um, gosh, I had such a great experience here as a, an assistant professor. I felt well supported. Um, I don't know that there's anything different except maybe mentoring groups. Um, for, for junior faculty. Junior faculty get mentoring in their home departments, but I think a multidisciplinary perspective could be really useful. I know some of my junior colleagues in communication sciences and disorders have, have been involved in writing groups or um, sort of peer groups with other assistant professors from other departments on campus, and it's been enormously um, productive and supportive. So I think we could uh, formalize that sort of by, by creating these things and letting people come to um, build these collaborative relationships early in their careers. I think that's kind of the way to get real collaboration is to build it at the beginning. It's harder once you're really well established to switch what you do to be more collaborative sometimes, I think. Any other questions? I have a question on how we do research. So by some measures of productivity, tens of thousands of publications. We have lots of grants, but from another perspective, every major pharmaceutical company in the world has exited the field of psychiatry. There hasn't been a new drug developed since the 1950s, and all of those were found serendipitously. So it really seems as if something is not going well in the way we do neuroscience research. And could you say a few words on your perspective on that, as opposed to measuring productivity by careers and others and publications? We don't seem to be making much progress in actually affecting people's lives in the research. I think that's a really good point, and that is, what if we think about productivity uh, based on outcomes, not on papers and grants and numbers? Um, and, and I think that's a really important point. Um, you know, it's really hard to do clinical research, and it's really hard to find clear results in clinical research. And I actually think that speaks to what I'd like to see us move into in the Wasteman Center is more outcomes-based work that impacts the lives of people with disabilities. And I think we need supports for that. We need infrastructure for that to, um, you know, make that possible for people without having to create whole new paradigms and whole new infrastructures to do it. But um, I agree, we should measure productivity by other things besides papers and grants. Thanks for the great talk. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you would do to integrate self-advocates and family members into the Wasteman Center? Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of training self-advocates or in terms of sort of recognizing the role of self-advocates? So I think integration holistically. Um, so training and also including self-advocates. So self-advocacy is a huge thing, right? Uh, you know, it's really hard to be run over and to be invisible if you're a person with a disability who doesn't know how to stand up um, or maybe doesn't have experience standing up to a really fast-moving world where people talk fast and everything happens quickly and maybe your voice isn't respected. Um, I think that's a really important uh, avenue for us to consider. I, I actually don't know what we do right now in terms of training self-advocates or self-advocacy, but I think it's something that we certainly could move into and should be recognized. 
um, many people are coming of age, uh, especially with the autism epidemic, who need to have self-advocacy skills. Um, and so what can we do to advance that cause? I think it's a great question. And it's one that could be you know, a research question as well. So. Any other questions? Okay, if we could.